So we are the Flyers from the University of Dayton, and tonight uh, Sam and myself, Brett, we will be uh, presenting to you. So for this... I have to scroll with it. For this competition, uh, we were uh, proposed to build a solar-powered surveillance aircraft. And to do this, uh, this was mainly so that we could create a rescue vehicle for uh, over large bodies of water because typically nowadays it's uh, helicopters, search boats, and it's a lot of manpower and a lot of resources are used, but it would be a lot simpler if you'd be able to send a small aerial aircraft out that did not have to return as often for refueling. And also it could fly in weather that in other words, in other ways might be hazardous for humans if they're aboard the aircraft. So to complete this goal, we needed to, we, we wanted to minimize the search time, uh, keep the costs of the overall aircraft low, require less personnel to operate the whole setup, uh, reduce the risk, as I mentioned, and utilize energy from the sun. Therefore, we don't have to use as much, we don't have to return as often. So for the actual aircraft, the design objectives that we wanted was we wanted a long endurance time uh, to achieve this, we needed to have a low weight, high efficiency, high stability, so that we weren't constantly using our energy resources to correct our flight. And we needed a high quality, low weight camera so that we could see uh, any r uh, victims or search and rescue personnel. And lastly, we needed to find solar panels that were efficient enough while also keeping the cost down because for this aircraft the solar panels were the main contributor to the cost. So mission goals uh, did I go the wrong way? So now the wheel works. <laughs> Alright, background research. So to start designing our aircraft we looked at a bunch of other resources that we had. So our first resource that we looked at was uh, looking at aircraft uh, that are out, already out in industry, specifically motorized gliders, because that is technically what we would be designing. And then after we looked at that information, we then looked at other planes that our team has made in the past. We have in our wind tunnel a bunch of our past planes just hanging up on the ceiling's walls. So that's a really good resource for us. And then we also studied similar solar aircraft that YouTubers and other people have designed. All right, so you kind of can jump into it, a quick run through of the design process and kind of the thought behind a lot of the decisions we made essentially. So the wing, we made a very high aspect ratio wing, as you can see there, it's an aspect ratio of about 20. And so the higher the aspect ratio, the more efficient it is. Um, and the problem is with that is you make it too high, then you have structural issues. You know, you might even break your wing during flight, so you gotta be really careful. Uh, another thing is you got a wingtip taper there, so you have less lift you're generating at the wingtips. Um, makes it more of an elliptical lift distribution, so you have less of a wingtip vortex. Um, you also notice there's a little bit of a dihedral at the wingtips, um, and it helps with our stability during flight, especially if you're doing search and rescue over something like Lake Erie where there could be high winds. You want to be able to stay in the air with that. Um, then the last thing is we had a high mount, so it's on top of our fuselage rather than the middle or down low. Um, it also helps with the stability there so that it's, um, not rocking one way or another. And it also helps with the ground clearance since we do have a belly landing. And another interesting thing they don't see a whole lot is the V-tail configuration on the tail. It also helps with the ground clearance so that you don't break it if you come in a little leaning one way or another. Um, and it also is lower weight uh, because there's less material there overall. Um, you can have some structural issues there also, but um, overall since we were making it pretty small, um, it wasn't too big of an issue for us. Another thing you notice is it's only, the only, all of our control surfaces are on the tail section of the plane. There's no ailerons or flaps in the main wing. And so essentially that's because we don't have to do a whole lot of maneuvering while we're flying. Essentially we just want to be up in the air, kind of go back and forth, maybe or we're going to run a grid or something like that to in search and rescue. And so um, we should just be able to work just fine with that and our testing has been fine um, when we did some flights. And so the only kind of Essentially, we mix a little more complex because we have to do control mixing with our controller. Um, but the way we have our controller set up, it makes it pretty simple with the uh, pilot to work it. 
um, notice. And then the other thing is, everybody's been talking about our landing, uh, our landing gear per se, our dolly that we use for takeoff. Um, and so it makes uh, our plane a lot lighter based on our prep past planes that we've done with the team. It will save us about a pound and a half. And the total weight of our plane right here is eight pounds. So that's actually pretty significant. Um, and so it's great for takeoff and then landing. We just kind of do a nice little belly landing in the grass there. Um, and our pilot's pretty good. He can go bring it down pretty nicely and it'll uh, be okay. The only risk there is possibly breaking a prop. And then on the bottom side of the fuselage, we have little skid plates essentially to help uh, make sure we don't tear it because the rest of it's monaco and pretty fragile otherwise. Um, and so, you know, we're more efficient with weight, also aerodynamics. Um, obviously your landing gear produce a lot of drag, especially when they're hanging out there. You're not using them for your entire flight um, and add a lot of weight to have something in there where you can stow them away for whatever. Um, so yeah, it's been a pretty good choice so far. Um, going to electronics, we have all sorts of different things in there being solar. So obviously we have our solar cells. Um, they can produce uh, about 45 watts of power total from them on a ideal day, I guess, under good circumstances, <coughs> based on the testing that we've done. Another thing in there is our Emax motor, which we did a little testing on our test stand at school where we compared that one to another one. This one was a little bigger and we liked it because it was slightly more efficient. And then also it had the extra power in there that we could produce because you can generate up to four and a half pounds of thrust with this. Um, and so if it is windy that day, or if you know something happens or we're gonna do a quick takeoff, that extra power there is really, really helpful for us. And so then the other thing is our vector flight controller, which is right here, in which you put on the center of gravity of the plane, and then you can essentially do stuff like GPS, automatic flying, um, you can do auto stabilization, things like that. So it's pretty helpful. So now I'm going to be moving on to how we actually design, like CAD designed and manufactured the aircraft. So the aircraft, once we had the it mathematically designed, like where, what aspect ratio and what airfoil we wanted, we created a SOLIDWORKS model of it. And this aided in the overall sizing of the aircraft because once in a while if you make a calculation you say, yeah, that makes sense, but when you put it on the assembly and you have a massive part, you'll say, no, that doesn't make sense just logically. So it helped us figure out er errors and then it also greatly helped us find the CG um, of the aircraft and also the weight of the aircraft because we could input the mass of the parts. And then uh, for manufacturing, many of our parts were 3D printed because we had a completely uh, complete CAD file for it. So for 3D printing, uh, it was used for the b most part, basically for the whole fuselage. Uh, this reduced the structural weight uh, compared to a fiberglass shell, which what we, which is what we were originally thinking of uh, in the fall. And then this used. For the filament, we use high temperature carbon fiber PLA. This provides a higher uh, tensile strength with a good stiffness. And uh, this proved better than other 3D printing materials. And then lastly, broken parts are really simple to uh, replace because you can just reprint them. So ribbon, sp ribbon spar tail construction. We, uh, for our tail, used uh, balsa wood and some pine uh, light plywood for model aircraft and we use the U University of Dayton's makerspace to carve them out on the X-carve and this reduced the weight from uh, a carbon fiber or fiberglass based tail structure and then it's also easier because if you break a small rib you're able to replace it much more easily than having to remake a whole wing or tail section. So the wing was made from fiberglass and carbon fiber uh, mixed with foam, uh, core with, mixed with a foam core. So the foam core adds the stability and then the carbon fiber uh, was laid on the underside with a fiberglass skin and that's what gave it its rigidity. And then, hmm? and then the entire wing was wrapped in two layers of monocoat. This helps smooth the aircraft while also it's how we have attached our solar panels to our aircraft. All right, so then based on the testing that we've done with our motors and then also the flight test that we did actually earlier this week, uh, we got an estimate of 155 watts of power we're gonna need for cruising flight. And then you can do pretty simple mass based on 
power required from the motor, and power from solar cells, and the difference is the power being drawn from our batteries. And so kind of long story short, you do a little math, and we can get up to one and a half hours, ideally, on a day, but some days like tomorrow, where it's going to be cloudy, possibly rainy, you're going to have a much lower time. So um, those considerations have to be taken into account. And so kind of going in the future, we're going to be looking at stuff like, you know, the improving technology with solar cells and batteries and things like that. They're more efficient, more high energy density and things like that. Um, we're also interested in scaling it up and doing a little design more based on those solar cells because you can then um, generate uh, with kind of like the simple design work that we've done, which is not a whole lot at this point, you can essentially make the plane more efficient and possibly get a full day flight, which is a kind of our goal, which is kind of essentially what the Coast Guard will be doing. So. Um, and so then we like also like to thank a few professors, Dr. Altman and Dr. Gunasekaran, who are professors at the University of Dayton, and Dr. Altman's also our advisor. They provide a lot of help every now and then with things. Um, and then we also like to thank Chris Fry, who's our team pilot and will be flying tomorrow, and the Dayton Makerspace, who has helped with like cutting parts and things like that, and then the Ohio Space Grant Consortium, of course. Do you have any questions from everybody about the design or manufacturing or anything. I was that. wondering if you did this 20% uh, percent, uh, aspect ratio, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and that was the, for efficiency. Yes. Uh, it seems to me that because you're doing a solar thing, that uh, like the, the one solar plane that you had there, they had three layers. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and, and I wonder if that wouldn't have helped your efficiency by. Mm -hmm. You know, sacrificing a little bit. And yeah, that was one of the really big things we were talking about with scaling it up. Is ideally, I'd love to get two or three rows of solar cells on there. And you know, you can see a lot of space on our plane where we don't have them, such as the spot spots where we have a dihedral and then our tail and things like that, or the fuselage. So there's a lot of room in there for improvement. And so I think this is a pretty decent first iteration. Um, there's a lot of room for improvement, though. So uh, there's a lot of opportunity. The other thing and testing. Uh, gave some numbers in terms of the, the power and things that you were getting out of your solar cells. Were these pointed directly at the sun, mm -hmm. or were they laying down like they would be on their wing? Yeah, so essentially the testing you did was like kind of the ideal case is the best case scenario. Um, we also did look at it where you have a bit different angles with the sun. You know, one day we did testing, it was like 6 p.m., another day it was earlier in the day, some things like that. Um, so yeah, again, it was that best case scenario because you know, with our wing, notice you have there's a layer of monocoat over the top of it, um, which reduces the percentage by a little bit. And yeah. he actually did some testing with it during one yeah. of his other classes too. And so, How much yeah. Was that? So, um, for my class, I had to do an ex I had to d design an experiment. So the experiment that I did was choosing different colors and different materials for covering over the panels. And so, transparent, like colorless transparent, reduces the efficiency by two to three percent. Um, if you did a transparent red, which is what our tail is made out of, that's actually very comparable to the colorless transparent, uh, transparent fill, uh, monocoat. It's about a 3 to 5% drop. Uh, if you go to the blue color, you're dropping off, I think it was 30 to 50% uh, of your power generation. Um, and that's just mainly because it's uh, not letting the light that the panels work off of through. Mm -hmm. What is that graph down there? Can you explain the graph you have? Yeah, sorry, it was a little small trying to fit it in. I um, thought it would be interesting to have in there. It's, that is the uh, testing we did for our, for our uh, motor. And so what it does is as we in essentially put more power to the motor, we're going to see how much thrust we're going to get out of it. Um, so we, we did some calculations with the essentially the specs we got online, um, but you know just to make sure we were accurate with what we were getting, we did a test on a test stand that we have in the lab, and so essentially we increased the power to see how much uh, thrust output we have, and then based on what we thought was the thrust we needed for cruising flight, we kind of get an estimate of what flight we need. Power. And the the test stand that we devised is it's on linear rails, so it's a fairly frictionless surface and. Uh, there's a 50 pound load cell uh, connected in between it right. and so we calibrated it so that any force generated we get a, a millivolt readout and then given our calibration uh, line of best fit we'd have an equation to uh, convert the millivolts into actual pounds so of thrust. How did you know uh, how many watts of 
what's required for crews? So we went through and based on like the preliminary kind of research that we were doing and like our airfoil and drag and things like that, um, we can get an estimated drag value and obviously for crews drag equals thrust, right? right? And so from that we could go and look at here and then also, you know, I mentioned earlier this week we actually had a flight um, and with the vector, it's another really cool thing is that um, we can, we're sending down a video to the ground um, for that feed then over top of that you can overlay all sorts of data such as your speed, your altitude, um, your voltage and your amperage and things like that. So that can give us more accurate data of how much power we're actually drawing. Um, so based on that flight we're actually using a little more thrust that we needed than we thought originally. So we had to edit some calculations in there to kind of modify our flight time. Yeah, I like everything you said but you skipped over all that stuff that was so important the details and maybe I'm not wanting to mm -hmm. the detail, but like the drag calculation yeah. and everything. Yeah, so um, we have a little bit in the paper um, yeah. going into it there. So we're looking at, you know, with your wing you have your parasitic drag and things like that and your lift induced drag there. Um, and so we have essentially kind of added them all up. We were looking at the drag from our fuselage. So we did a little bit of research on, you know, different kind of shapes of your fuselage. Yeah. And so we essentially try to pick the closest shape to what we were going to be building um, to get an estimate for that and then I all sorts of different things right. like that. I, yeah. You did a good job in there. I, I, okay. I, guess, I guess since that's so, so important for your design is knowing the power requirement, mm -hmm. it seems like you could have probably focused on that drag calculation in the presentation a little more yeah. to really substantiate that 155 watts of required power. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Now, when, sure. when you're when you're taking off, what are you using to take off? Your stored battery power? Is that yeah, it's going to be your stored battery power. So, yeah. you know, the ideal estimate that we do with the calculations here, it ignores the extra power that you need okay. for your takeoff. Yeah. So it's going to be a little less than that. Um, so it's not like going in every little detail, you know, if you're going around of, yeah. you know, like for the flight we're doing the standard um, altitude, so we're going to stay right at 200 feet, which is nice thing you have to take off and landing. So and, wind and things like that. So how much power do you need to take off? Take off? Um, I don't have an exact number. I think we did, yeah, because the one flight we did, it was, yeah, what did you say? It was, it was around 400 watts. On 400, power. yeah. So when, where's the critical location? The, the what? The critical location. Critical location? <laughs> yeah, takeoff is, uh, is where we drain the majority of our... Yeah, what stage of takeoff? Uh, I mean, getting spooling up the motor and getting the, the yeah the all of it moving. essentially. Like the once it's once it's moving, that trickles down a little bit. Yeah, yeah. we have to get this. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. We have to, that. Yes. That's once we <laughs> once we over once we get it moving, then we go over comments. So looking forward to seeing that. Before. Yeah, and that, that's <laughs> actually probably our main concern right now. Especially tomorrow, we might have wet grass. We're trying to cut through. Yeah. We're not sure how short the grass is at the field. Um, so that's a big concern, and making sure we can get up to speed and how bumpy the ground is, and a lot of things well, like that. Well, normally it's when you go from in ground to out of ground effect where you need your most thrust. Yeah. But with that, yeah, that's I don't know for sure. If that's yeah, true. essentially what we do is we put it up pretty much full throttle and try and get the speed up to get off the ground. So usually when you're right about takeoff speed, what you do is you just take the plane, you just pull up really fast, get it right off that dolly. Um, yeah. We did a test flight earlier in the week <laughs> where. Um, during takeoff, we had one wing come off those little front bumper bars, and so the other wing was still pushing on it, and it made the dolly kind of fall over underneath the plane, but the plane was becoming airborne, and so it was able to fly away, and luckily our pilot is very good, and so <laughs> he would do better than any of us would have handled that situation. His name is Chris Fry. He's a local not, resident. Yeah. The, yeah, yeah, sorry. Ideally, a hand launch would conserve a lot of power for us because if yeah. you do yeah. like a running launch at 15 mile an hour, which is its, its takeoff speed, then you could you could conserve a considerable amount of energy. So why don't you do? That? We oh, were we were the yeah we were mainly concerned because the rules state you can only have a one-handed launch. You can't have a running start. You can oh, only okay. walk. So we were concerned about if we would actually get the airspeed that we needed yeah, to, to produce lift with our wing. Yeah. Yeah, and like the fuselage, um, that's one thing we'd yeah, do. It's, it's is an awkward shape to grab. Yeah, you, it's really hard to hold with one hand. It's a little, it's like you need like a baseball glove <laughs> to kind of throw it out and get it big enough. But yeah, we talked about it a little bit. Yeah, mm. we were, 
that's what, that's one reason why we brought up if we could use a dolly in the fall yeah. because we were concerned it, we wanted to remove the landing gear but we were concerned that without a running start or without a two-handed launch or some sort of assistance one question i had was Color test, your motor test, and everything. Uh, so, trying to get power versus thrust. Uh, but this is a static test, right? Yes. yes. So, I mean, that's only good for when you begin your. Yeah, which is yeah, probably why we were off. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. when I mentioned we weren't quite accurate um, when we actually did the flight test. Yeah. Um, and we talked about putting it in the wind tunnel and doing another test later on. Yeah. But we is like school and time, and just never ends up happening. And the other, the ma another main reason, <laughs> <laughs> another the other stuff that he's talking about is a lot. There was a lot of class projects using the wind tunnel at the yeah, time. Yeah, really So we schedule. we just we couldn't line up our schedules with the wind tunnel in order to get in it. Yeah. So everything that we did had to be either static or separate from the wind tunnel. Yeah. One thing we probably should have done though is even though we didn't do the test, you probably make a decent estimate and say, hey, we're actually going to need a little bit more. But you know, kind of going to that second design iteration will take those into account. How much twist in the propeller do you have? Like torque? No, I mean, 6.5. Yeah, it, oh, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, yeah. it's a 16 inch yeah, prop 16 with 5.5. 5. 5. 5. 5. Yeah. So if that was a little less, then you wouldn't have that static, nearly as much of a static problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But with that much of a pitch, that's really important. Yeah. What, what, what battery do you actually do this? So originally we were going to use four <laughs> uh, six cell 3,600 milliamp, 3,600 milliamp batteries, but we had an issue with our CG. Um, the batteries were just too far forward, um, and we thought some of the electronics that we would have in the aircraft would counterbalance it a little bit more, but they ended up not doing that. Um, so we ended up having to take two of our batteries out. So currently we have two batteries. Two uh, They're six cell, thirty six hundred milliamp. And then we have a design change request form that we brought with us to change that because it you know it brings our CG a little bit aft, kind of make it balance a little more. Um, we also actually had to throw a little bit of a weight in the tail um, <laughs> just to make it just so it's nice um, for our pilot. It was one of the recommendation that he had the other night. It was. It is flyable of without the weight. Changes. It is flyable without the weight, but uh, yeah. our pilot, he, he he requested it mainly just so he wouldn't have to keep fighting it. Yeah, you have to. Um, set or without thing. having to s trim the tail because he wanted as much maneuverability as he could so in case there's a wind. So your flight voltage is what? Twenty-four. Twenty-four. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's fresh. Yeah. Your. Uh, Um, so it it'll vary. Um, so that's one thing. So we actually have a transformer on the plane, small one, that will put it to the right voltage so that it can then feed in properly. So that's one issue that we don't have to have um, when we have that device, which is great. Do you know what voltage range that is? Um, it, oh, with the solar cells? Like what they produce, it really depends oh, on oh the... Oh, man, off the top of my head. For one, it mainly... You happen to remember? So, so like, full sunlight, each cell produces 0.6 volt at 6 amp. Uh, but at what we found, that's the rated value. That's yeah, what did you find? Watt rated value for each cell. Uh, what we found is that as the sun drops off, the current drops off more than the voltage. It kind of stays at a steady voltage, uh, and the current reduces. So... Together in series, these 14 put out, put out around uh, 8.5 volt at like a max. Um, like if we're getting like direct sunlight at the right angle, but as that angle drops down, it, it goes down like the 6 volt range. So six, eight and a half down to 6. Mm -hmm. And then the, that hits a step up transformer. That yeah. Makes it transformer. Yeah. Um, so you're your battery is running at 24 volts, so then you step up. Yep. Your yeah, the solar, solar cell to yeah. 24. Yes, correct. Do you use a charge controller? No. We opted yeah. not to use uh, a charge controller on this iteration. Um, we looked into both the uh, MPPT and the PWN charge controllers, but 
we found like mixed information on using the lipos, um, and we decided we needed more testing and more just more experience with that the kind of technology to implement on this design. Oh, um, if one cell starts to get uh, either too low or too high, we have a little blink. Is it a blinky? Yeah, yeah that's yeah. That's just a, a low voltage indicator. Yeah. On, on so. The um, it gets really loud um, if <laughs> yeah, there's if there's a cell issue in our battery. So it you will hear a loud siren. Um, so that will warn us that something uh, with our battery is going wrong. Um, so far, we haven't had any issues. The also does like a motor yep. pulsing thing to let the pilot know that as well. Mm -hmm. And we have information on that. Oh, yeah, so. the yeah on-screen display helps a lot with that kind of stuff too, which is really good. Um, you can get a lot of information. You have telemetry on your transmitter or on your receiver. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Some video screen. Or yeah, yeah, we have a monitor where um, we'll get. We've made it so you can get uh, pitch and uh, roll yep. telemetry you have with all that on there with, ba with battery all, yeah, voltage, amperage. Uh, do we have we have altitude? Mm -hmm. um, speed. GPS. Altitude, airspeed, million power consumed. Yeah, and the really cool thing is that, yeah, with the GPS on it, you can set waypoints. So if you want it to essentially go in a big circle, you can tell it to do that, and that's exactly what it'll do. So it's pretty neat. Um, and then again, I mentioned earlier, you got that stability stuff. So, you know, if there's a really big gust of wind, obviously the pilot's going to have to come in and do something. But, you know, little things, essentially, of stability can handle those pretty well, and it just automatically works with servos.